both. Well, and on a personal note, this is really um, this is really special to me as a Black Indigenous woman. Um, in this moment, hearing my Indigenous people, Black people, and their voices getting heard, Rashad and Crystal, you both lead organizations that really are focusing on relevating those voices and helping um, broader communities to understand how to engage with um, the, the issues that folks are becoming more and more aware of. Chris, I'll start with you. Talk a little bit about Illuminative and how you're thinking um, and, and the, the ethos of Illuminative and what you guys are up to in this time. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much. It's so good to be here and thanks to Spectrum for inviting me. And I just, I first want to start off and just say, Rashad, it's it's good to see you and I'm sending you good thoughts. I feel like every time I turn on the TV, you are there and I just, I hope that you're finding some time to sleep and and take care of the work that you and Color of Change are doing. It's um. And just it's it's beautiful, um, it's powerful, it's needed, and I bet you're tired. Um, so you know, really, Illuminative was founded um, based on a, a body of, of research. It was the largest public opinion research project ever done um, about Native Americans, and we wanted to get into the minds of the American public and understand what are the dominant narratives about Native peoples. What are those perceptions, and how do those perceptions that non-Native people have about Native people? impact us. Um, it's called the Reclaiming Native Truth Project. Nadia um, was actually our founding like sort of program officer at Kellogg. Kellogg was our angel investor in that in that work. And really what that work showed us um, is that, you know, invisibility is the greatest threat in many ways to Native peoples um, and that nearly 80 percent of Americans know little to nothing about us. 72 percent of Americans never even encounter information about us on a daily basis. And what that causes is that nearly two thirds of Americans don't even think we face discrimination um, and which doesn't line up with the fact that we, you know, like our, you know, African-American, you know, relatives, you know, win the races we don't want to win when we talk about health disparities. Right. Or the fact that, you know, proportionately to our population, Native Americans, you know, die at the hands of police at, at, at you know, the highest, some of the highest rates in the country. Um, and so really, you know, as we found it illuminative and began to understand the power of invisibility to feel bias and racism and discrimination, um, we really began to see it was a systems wide issue, right, that's perpetuated in, in media and entertainment, K through 12 education, our systems of government. Um, and it, it's really institutionalized in terms of not only our erasure, but that systemic racism. Um, that's really with embedded and permeates every level of our society. And so really Illuminative's mission has really been about calling out those systems of, of racism and discrimination that are impacting Native peoples today. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's really, you know, and now more than ever in this in this moment, um, you know, we stand with our African-American brothers and sisters and we feel it. Um, and I feel angry every time I see a white person get on TV and say that systemic racism is an issue in this country. Um, and it's, it's, it, it permeates every level of our society. And I'm just also at the same time, just so moved and called to action with so many who are taking to the streets that I think we're really in an incredible moment for change. Rashad, I know, uh, you know, I'm not Oprah, but you know, I try to be in my, in my spare time, uh, but Color change. You guys are, are really driving a lot of the, the conversation and really helping to amplify the real issues that are going on here. What, what, what are you guys up to right now? How are you guys managing all of the incoming right now, especially yeah. around so many voices want to be heard right now? Yeah. Oprah, Oprah called me to thank me for the thing, and I don't answer block calls, and so she left the message, which was actually great because I could at least play it for my mom. Um, and so, um, <laughs> And so there was that sort of moment, but awesome. you know, all of all of that, all of that aside, right? Part of what we try to do in all of this work is we talk about translating presence into power. And what does that mean, right? It means that visibility and awareness, that uh, retweets, stories from the front of the page are not enough if we don't have the ability to change the rules, right? America um, can love black culture and hate black people at the same time, and so we can't mistake. Uh, a black president for the ability to actually end systemic racism. All of those things, um, presence is important, visibility is important, awareness is important, but far too often we kind of stay there. And so what we are really focused on is how do we drive as much energy towards strategic action? If you had talked to me 
three weeks ago, I would have told you 1.7 million people have taken action with Color of Change in the last eight months. Um, and that would have made us the largest race, online racial justice organization in the country. It would have made us have the largest sort of digital footprint in terms of email list and being able to actually move people up a ladder of engagement um, out of any sort of uh, racial justice organization. Today, I can say over 7 million people have taken action with us in the last eight months. That is an incredible, unprecedented amount of growth in terms of people sort of wanting to take action. And what we hold a real high standard about is like, what kind of action is actually strategic? Right. How do we actually drive people towards things that will change? And so when I talk about narrative change, I am really talking about the rules and norms of society. What is acceptable on one end and what is possible on the other end, right? White people taking off their cell phones now in a Starbucks and filming something and knowing that they've got to send it in because they've caught their a movement has changed their context. And then how do we then translate to actual like systemic rule change at corporations? How do we change that in rule change in terms of how police engage? How do we change that in terms of having elected a district attorney in Philadelphia that now doesn't prosecute in that situation because there's been a new set of power sort of and a new set of dynamics created. And so we're constantly thinking about how do we channel that energy? How do we make good on that energy? And so the thing I will say before we sort of continue is right, when we're talking about sort of this moment around criminal justice, when we're talking about sort of as we're talking about policing, you know, for the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has steadily went down, basically steadily went down. But yeah. according to Pew and others, most Americans think that violent crime is going up. So here is where when we talk about narrative, right, not just stories out in the world, but the gap between perception and reality. And the gap between perception and reality creates all sorts of demands for type policing that is unnecessary. It disincentivizes investments that we should actually have. It creates a hostile climate, right? And so we can, so then how do we then deal with it, right? And so at Color of Change, we very much think about narrative infrastructure. And I've done a lot of writing about narrative infrastructure. You can find some of that at colorofchange.org backslash narrative power. And, um, and sort of there, you can sort of see some of the ways in which we're really talking about how do we actually build the infrastructure to control the way our stories are told? And so that means that we've got to control and deal with the rules at social media platforms. We have to deal with the rules and how stories are told in news. We have to engage Hollywood and deal with the rules of how stories are told. Yes, we have to find ways to- Investment committees too. Yes, yes, <laughs> all, of, all of these places, right? Because actually when we, and so like the, up to that point, right? Over the course of the last two weeks, I've gotten more calls from corporations yeah. than I've been, I mean, more unsolicited calls, I should say. Sometimes they, <laughs> they call me back when we call about campaigns, but I'm getting calls, I'm getting waking up to announcements from corporations saying we're giving us money that I have active campaigns against. And I'm like, no, you're not giving us money, but I would love to get on the phone with you. And now CEO, now that you want to talk, I've got some things I need you to do. Yeah. Um, and so all of that to say, right, we are, there is this moment, there is this context. I write a, a, a monthly column, monthly recently, because I haven't delivered, but I just published today. And I talk a lot about the intersection between race, politics, and corporate power. And really trying to back, go back to this idea of not mistaking presence for power. Not allowing um, Black Lives Matter hashtags to, lead, hashtags to lead the day, but actually mm -hmm. allowing the actions that actually make Black Lives Matter be the sort of uh, framework for what we accept. That's right. And 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 so that's a question for for like how do we take these these folks who are just coming to understand the narratives, the how the narratives have been pre presented, and the reality, right? So we're raising up Native, uh, Black, Latinx, all these different uh, these groups are starting to be able to have a voice around the narratives. How can uh, those of us who are here as investors, as social enterprises, entrepreneurs, individually, right? So Nadia talked about good intention, folks. So how do how do we start to learn about these histories and really steep ourselves in this so we don't get in your ways? Yeah. Crystal, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's one, it's turning over the mic. It's creating space for those conversations. And understanding that you will be uncomfortable, right? And this is the moment. This is really the moment to sit back, to listen, to create the space, to really understand the role that 
you know, systemic racism plays. And when we talk about real things like white supremacy, right, and understanding, right, that who is really controlling these different rules, these norms, all of these systems, right, that Rashad just talked about, right, we have to look at it. It's not just one place that we're going to find it. These dominant narratives, these things um, are being perpetuated by large scale systems in this country. And we have to have a reckoning. Mm -hmm. Right. And there has to be a reckoning in this country and in this moment that this country is built on stolen land. It's built on stolen bodies and stolen labor. And, you know, when we went out and we did our research, so many Americans we talked to said, you know what? All of that happened a long time ago. That's a long time ago. Everybody needs to get over it. But what we saw play out on the streets of Minneapolis, what we see happen with, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, when we see you know, the same officer that killed George Floyd killed a Leech Lake tribal citizen, Wayne Rates. Right, this is going on and on and on. This is not new, this has been happening. It's just, thank God, you know, that we now, cell phones have video cameras, right? And there is that culture shift, there's that norm shift that people are pulling out their phones, right? But it is really that recognition that this isn't going away, right? That this is, this is the wrecking that needs to happen and it's good for everyone, but it is really about the intentionality of not just corporations standing up and the hypocrisy that came out on Blackout Tuesday with so many different corporations, right, who are out there like the Washington football team saying we don't we don't support racism when their team name is a dictionary defined racial slur. So Roger Goodell, NFL, you know what? You made one small step. You should have apologized to Colin Kaepernick, right? You should go a lot further than that. But if the NFL and all these professional sports teams and so many are really committed to ending systemic racism, then their words need to be more than just these hollow kind of yeah. words that they put out on social media, right? This really comes with every aspect of it, which includes the racism that Native Americans have faced at the hands of professional sports, the right, or the way that Native Americans are erased within media and entertainment, right? Even though, you know, we see these instances of police violence and other things happening in our communities, they're not covered, even by the admission of media, right, in terms of Native Americans. So in this moment, we really need a conversation around racial justice and about ending systemic racism that is really all inclusive, right? And we need our white allies, we need those folks to step back and create space and hold space, right, in this moment and to listen to the people that are closest to the pain, that really understand. And I really think in that way, with that great intentionality, and it's gonna be uncomfortable, <laughs> Yeah. that that's the way what we're really going to start to see the change. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also, and I was just going to echo um, on, on your point there, Crystal, that it's also about uh, us individually understanding our own power and the, and the way that the power um, flows within our respective um, systems. So for instance, for us in investments, where I'm, where I'm sitting is, you know, is like how investors and how um, they don't recognize their power and how that can perpetuate interpersonal structural violence through, you know, you're, you're not good enough to be in our fund or even making folks jump through a tremendous number of hoops to get to a no, right? I've seen this time and time again. And so I'm curious, Rashad, just like, as we think about our individual sectors that we all represent, like, how do we start to change those narratives in from the inside out? Yeah, I really want to pick off of pick up off of where Crystal was going, because I, I think it's just incredibly um, important actually when folks have been asking me what are some of the worst sort of like displays of um, sort of like corporations I always use the Washington football team as one of my um, examples of uh, it's a good go-to of, go -to. of just yeah I mean well like just being part of the NFL in and of itself and then sort of uh, the years and years of campaigns and some of just the sort of work I have done in very, very small ways to help at different times advise folks who have been trying mm -hmm. to run campaigns or give some, you know, support. But I want to give you all some things that you can do now because I feel like here are some things that I think you can do. First, we have to stop telling stories that are unfortunate and start telling stories that are about unjust, right? When we yeah. tell stories that are unfortunate, like a car accident, like it sort of just happened. There's no one to blame. There's no sort of systems at play. We give people permission to move for move forward with charitable solutions to structural problems, right? We give people too much credit for simply sending water bottles to Flint, then forcing corporations to pay their fair share of taxes. So folks actually have clean pipes. That okay. we give people credit for doing service days at inner city schools instead of recognizing that our tax structure, which is 
been been built upon so many sort of years of fight of 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 racism of um austerity of um economic choices that um that it is not an accident that these schools are this way and it's it is it has been um a choice of our government and we can't simply give credit for mentorship days at inner city schools we actually have to change the schools charitable solutions to structural problems is what we end up getting when we tell stories that are unfortunate rather than unjust um we far too often talk about black communities indigenous communities communities of color women we talk about folks poor folks all the time as vulnerable you know I am vulnerable sometimes when I see an ex that's too happy on social media. I'm like vulnerable. Like that's when I gotta like do something, do something personal for myself. I have to call my therapist to like work it out. So like I'm not doing something. Like that's an individual thing that I've got to work on. That's vulnerability. Black communities are not vulnerable. We've been attacked. We have been targeted. We have been exploited. Like when you talk about our communities as vulnerable, then the energy goes to fixing our communities and our families, not fixing the structures that actually put us in harm's way. And it takes away, it's this way in which we use a passive voice for systems and active voice for people, when in fact we have to, if you actually want to solve these problems, we have to put the active voice on the systems that harm us. You know, we will say things like, Black people are less likely to get loans from banks instead of banks are less likely to give loans to black yep. people. We will say indigenous can people you, are less likely- Can you say likely. that again for the folks in the back? Can you say we will again? say black people are less likely to get loans from banks instead of saying banks are less likely to get loans from black people, right? Then what we do is we spend all of our time with financial literacy programs for black people to help fix us, to get into a, a system that is actually systemically excluding us. We don't force the system to actually have to change. We we put the energy on people, right? We will say indigenous folks, black folks, women are less likely to get hired by tech companies. Instead of saying tech companies are less likely to hire us, right? Then we end up with, oh, let's do mentorship programs so these folks are ready to get inside of systems that have been designed to exploit, keep them out, target them, right? right. We do this all the time in terms of the ways in which we, what we put our energy into. Finally, I want to say that, you know, we are in a deep moment of like cultural and political change where I believe inflection points are those things where we can go radically forward or move radically backwards. And part of that is that we can't just talk about black people in this moment and talk about the pain and talk about the struggle. Yes, that's sometimes how the activism comes. But I want to be really clear that black people, indigenous folks, we are the protagonists in the American story. Right. No one has fought harder to get educated and vote in this country than black people and, and have to do it and had to do it in the face of so much struggle. And I I just simply kind of need to make sure that we are constantly just as we are talking about policing, as we are talking about these moments of black pain, that we are also centering black brilliance, black creativity, black joy in this moment. Black joy is not the absence of pain, but it's the presence of aspiration, not just what we are fighting against, but what we are fighting for. And the importance of that is as even as we think about, right, when I think I agreed to this, I think we were in the sort of COVID age and where that was yeah. the sort of main story. We were talking about sort of the, the ways in which we um, were seeing all of the uh, failures of our government, the, the targeting of our government on black folks come to bear as this disease ripped across. And we weren't seeing nearly enough of it when we think about our indigenous brothers and sisters in terms of the invisibility of all of the ways in which um, they've been exploited by um, the targeting and uh, austerity that's happened on both indigenous lands and non-indigenous right. lands in terms of the healthcare disparities. Both of those things are sort of very clear and those stories are different and as a result, the levers are different. But I say that to say that black people were at the front lines of being un, um, essential workers, providing the kind of tools, food, resources that we need. We created some of the most um, joyful and um, hopeful spaces on Instagram Live and on social media that help people sort of get through this struggle. If we can't, if we only can tell stories of pain and not tell stories of hope, aspiration, and joy, we don't actually build the and collective energy. 
an and opportunity, opportunity. To, yes, to build the for energy for us yeah, to fight for a better tomorrow. So I just right. say that as we think about what we can do today, there are things that all of us are doing in the stories that we tell and the language that we use that incentivize the wrong things that put the focus on the wrong type of action and narrative, right? If it is the sort of rules and norms of society, what is acceptable and what is possible, then we have to raise the floor on what's acceptable and push up the ceiling on what's possible, shifting the rules on what we can demand and what we should have. And all of that has to do with how we engage as much as the, how the That's rest right. of the world does. That's right. Thanks, Rashad. I think if, uh, for, for folks in, in our field and philanthropy and investment, I think about uh, the work that, you know, thy colleagues that are investing are starting, where we don't know how to do this. We're trying to create entirely new value systems, right? And, and conversations. And so for me, I know I'm committed to working on making sure how we are, are, are uh, including communities and not because we, we all make choices every day. And we have some choices that we can make that, that are, are better than others for communities and others that are not. And I think that it's a, a, in context of these conversations with you both, it's, those, it's gonna be on all of us to really look, about, look at those um, decisions we've made. And if those are decisions we wanna make in the future. I'm going to turn it over to Crystal for one, uh, closing and Rashad for some closing remarks. So you are allowed uh, two, uh, two kind of next steps for folks on the call, right? Where, what to read, obviously your websites are incredibly, um, you can see them here in the, in the chat room and uh, incredible resources, but what else can folks do to work on themselves so they can understand these narratives? Yeah, and I just really want to tag on to what, you know, Rashad was saying about the power of these stories, right? These dominant narratives about Black and Indigenous peoples. And, and the prevailing narrative about Native peoples is that we are broken and we are a problem to be solved and we require a savior to come in and fix us. And that has been the narrative that played out all throughout COVID-19, right? Instead of recognizing actually tribal nations overall have managed to keep their COVID cases down. And despite the systemic and, you know, massive failures of the federal government to really stand up to its obligations to native peoples and i think to all peoples i mean it's COVID laid bare the gross inequities in the system of which people of color indigenous peoples are the ones that are right in the bullseye right that are suffering the most because of these yeah. systemic issues and failures and so it's really beginning to understand how the power of those stories and particularly with regard to native peoples that were a problem to be solved or we just sort of don't exist that is rampant throughout philanthropy in this right. sector. And then right. that is part of the problem and, and the power of saying, recognize that part of the problem, you know, and it, Rashad and I were in another conversation not too long ago and I was sharing that I spoke to a, a program officer at the height of COVID saying, we need resources because invisibility is a matter of life or death during this pandemic. We need right. to get resources out so that we can, we can really put them to work in Indian country and was literally told that that foundation had already funded another native project it might find one more. And that was sort of this cap within. Now, I know this person to be a good person, right? But I know that she's also operating within a system, within philanthropy. And knowing that less than, is it what, 8% of, of communities of color and indigenous peoples get foundation dollars? I mean, these are the things, if you want to help, that sitting in your rooms and sitting in those chairs and those decisions is to have a real reckoning to look at the way that all of these things, including within the space of philanthropy, and when we talk about investment, how it's perpetuating some of these things. And there is such an amazing opportunity to turn to look to Native peoples, not as a problem to be solved, but partners at the table around real solutions. That yes, to celebrate also Native joy, Native brilliance, Native innovation. There is so many good things happening, but yet we can't, nobody wants to let us out of that box of disparity. And we are ready, it is happening. We are breaking through. Standing Rock was the signal of that, mm -hmm. right? And the, mm -hmm. power, the power that Native people are building. And we will be at the table. We are going to be a force that we want to join forward. And when it comes to the election this fall, you know, in those seven critical battleground states, Native vote, vote is going to be incredibly important. And we are so excited, Indian country is so excited to stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone that wants this change. Right? So I guess my final point would be, you know, come follow us on Illuminative, be a part of, you know, these calls to make the Washington football team finally change the name, right? To have the level of accountability to bring down statues of Columbus and all of these other symbols of hate and racism in our country. That is a beginning and just the work that you can do within your own space and, and job. 
Thank you, Crystal. Rashad, close us out. I think we're seeing a lot on the news right now. And I think it's really important that we remember that people don't experience issues, they experience life. That the forces that hold us back are in, in a related political inequality goes hand in hand with economic inequality. Uh, a, a racist criminal justice system requires a racist media culture to keep it alive, to keep it sustained, to create the demand for it. And all of those things operate. And so, you know, I, there are no silver bullets to dealing with structural inequality and structural racism. Right. What I know is that what we need is power. We do not have a lack of ideas. Our movement has tons of ideas. Some are more aspirational than, than I'm ready, and, well, maybe my members are ready to fight for. Some are, um, are, um, are way too reform-based, right? So it's not the question of ideas and innovation. It is the question of power. And so the question is, is what do we do together to like build the power to actually change those rules long term? So I guess I just want to welcome you in to join us. Um, visit colorofchange.org backslash narrative power and download some of the writing. We have more coming out. Some of the stuff I was supposed to finish is not quite done because of everything that's been happening. And, and I, I get to be a perfectionist about some of this. Or Can you just sleep on one hour a night? I mean, the two is 